So our next speaker, Dr. Irmina Van Dyken, dazzled us last night. So our expectations are high. <laughs> but I have a feeling those expectations are going to be met or exceeded. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Van Dyken. Good afternoon. Welcome back. I trust you all had a very good lunch. Now that you have full bellies and all the blood's going to go to your stomach to digest your food, I'm going to try to steal some of that blood to stick in your brain so we can talk and have you learn some important things and some things that I'm very, very excited about. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is immunonutrition. It's a new term. It's one of these new places in medicine that's being studied defined as on the slide. So it's interrelatedness of diet, nutrition, the immune system, microbiomes, telomeres, and longevity. All of these things are gonna correlate and coincide and weave together to talk about immunonutrition. I cannot talk about one without talking about the others. Other thing, a catchy term we have in this day and age is biohacks. I'm gonna talk about biohacks to enhance your immune system. Anybody know what a biohack is? What, what is that? Sounds bad. It sounds bad. <laughs> so yeah, you think about a hacker, right? A hacker is somebody that hacks a computer, gets into the hard drive or the internet and completely restructures that computer. Biohacking is a new term that's been coined and it's actually something that's pretty interesting. It has both good and bad connotations. You can use it how you will. The definition of biohacking is this. It's a verb, to use systems thinking, science, biology, and self-experimentation to take control of and upgrade your body, your mind, and your life. Pretty simple. A lot of times we do this anyways, right? We're always just trying to upgrade our life, upgrade our body, upgrade our mind. We do it by the diet we eat, but this is a conscious effort to really hack into our biomes, to really try to improve our life our body and our mind. So biohacking to me is something that's exciting. We can do it, we're already doing it, we just don't know that we're doing it, but we can talk a little more about how to really tailor that to your health. Hopefully this talk will turn some things upside down for you, put you upside down and you can see the world in a whole new perspective. So a little background, I didn't tell you too much last night. This is where I live. I live in Hawaii. This is one of my favorite places on the entire island, Kaneohe Bay. We take our sailboat there, we sail, it's beautiful. Big coral reef, one of the biggest protected coral reefs in that side of the Pacific Ocean. It's gorgeous. Here's my hospital. This is one of the places where I spend most of my time doing surgery, of course. Despite all that beauty, there's still so many challenges in Hawaii. And not only in Hawaii, but in the world in general. <laughs> Any of you that have been to Hawaii know Spam is their delicacy, they love it. If there is something that is so bad, the worst thing you can put into your body ever, it's gonna be spam. It's horrible stuff. Look at the ingredients on there, they're right up here. What do we got? Pork, salt, and oil, the top three ingredients. Unbe unbelievably bad for you, and your arteries, and your body in general. Hawaiians like to make this delicacy. It's called Spam Musubi. It's one of their favorite things. A Little bit of rice, you take some Spam, maybe an egg you put on there, some nori on there. They love it. They eat it all the time. You pick it up in zippies, you pick it up anywhere you want. It's not a heart healthy food. <laughs> Probably one of the worst things that you can put in your body, right? So, the immune system to me is something that's very important. It's something we can biohack, we can manipulate, we can eat to strengthen our immune system and to just tweak little things around here and there, lower inflammation and lower our chances of chronic disease. So the immune function and nutrition are closely intertwined. In order to have a healthy immune system, you need to have a good nutritional profile. You need to be eating very well. The human immune system is overwhelmingly complex. There's so many different things that contribute to your immune system. Your immune system has checks and balances, and we have courses in medical school that go on forever and ever about the immune system. 
what regulates it, what turns it on, what turns it off. And these are things that we're starting to study and learn a lot more about. The one thing we do know, as I said, is inflammation is very closely related. When we have a chronic, low-grade inflammatory state, it comp compromises our immune system. So we want to avoid this inflammation. We want to avoid things in our diet that can trigger the inflammation. Because by default, we're going to be damaging our immune system. Inflammation in acute illness, in disease, in something that comes out of nowhere and is life-threatening, that's a good thing. Acute inflammation is good. That's our body's defense, our, our impetus to get better. But chronic inflammation, this chronic low grade from our diet, from our spam, is very bad for us. That's what we need to avoid. I'm going to talk a little bit about the microbiome after that. The microbiome is fascinating. The largest portion of our immune system lives in our gut, in our GI tract. And it's really exciting stuff that we're learning how to manipulate. And then lastly, I'm going to touch on telomeres before I finish my talk. Also, some very, very cool stuff coming out with that. So talk about inflammation a little bit, and then we'll get into a little bit about how to modify inflammation. And remember, by decreasing inflammation, you're going to actually improve your immune system and strengthen it. So inflammation comes from the Latin root word inflammatio, which is a setting on fire. In medical school, we learn these four terms for inflammation. These are the clinical signs of inflammation. This is what we see in anybody that has inflammation going on. We have ruber, which is redness, calor, which is heat, tumor is swelling, and dolor is pain. Those four things have to be there in order to have ongoing inflammation. Here we have a complicated medical diagram. No need to memorize all this, but there's some important things that I want to show you. Inflammation is huge. It's a serious thing. You have chronic inflammation on the top. You get all of these activators, these reaction, reactive oxygen species. You get inflammatory inflammate, goes down, sends up all these signals throughout your whole body. Just like we heard about this morning, you have angiogenesis, that blood, the blood vessels going to the tumor and creating tumor cells, cancer progression, and you're going to get cancer promotion, progression, and invasion. So it's a direct link between inflammation and cancer. And as I said, inflammation is very closely regulated by the body. We have a whole bunch of checks and balances. We know how to turn inflammation on, off. We have all these little molecules in our body that does it for us. Quick example, again, very medical, but I just put this up here to show you. There's all these feedback mechanisms, molecules that turn inflammation on, off. It's very, very complex stuff. The one thing we do know about inflammation, the systemic, low-grade inflammation, it's a strong, consistent, independent predictor of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease. It's a strong statement. All-cause mortality by chronic, low-grade inflammation. Inflammation's where it's at. We really need to stop inflammation in its tracks before it gets out of hand. So we've studied this. Chronic inflammation has been associated with all these disorders that are up there. Cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, atherosclerosis, so the heart disease, asthma, Alzheimer's disease, very strong connections between all of that. And all of this is potentially very modifiable. Some more official data from the American Heart Association. They came out with this quote just last year. The leading risk factor for death and disability in the United States is suboptimal diet quality, which in 2010 led to 678,000 deaths. This is coming from the American Heart Association. They go on to say this. Major contributors were insufficient intakes of fruits, nuts, seeds, whole grains, vegetables, they do say seafood, as well as excess intakes of sodium. So to have the American Heart Association make a statement that is that powerful, saying that diet is responsible for all of these deaths, that's a big deal. We need to wake up and turn our lives around. We can't be succumbing to this. It's self-inflicted. It's essentially suicide. Quiz time for you guys. This is a study of the standard American diet done in 2010. I want to know what you guys think. 
The average adult consumes a total of just how many cups of fruits and vegetables in a typical day? This is a standard American diet. 1.8 cups. The blue is a little hard to see in the back. How many are recommended? What's the minimum? Six and a half. That's what we want to get, a minimum. And our average American is getting just 1.8 cups, OK? What percent of the population do you think achieves this target for vegetable consumption? Two. Pretty low. We're looking at 6.4. So not very much of Americans are going to get that. And then the staggering thing on the bottom. So yeah, yeah, OK, maybe they got a couple cups. But it was orange juice and potatoes. Yeah, so nutritionally, what do you think about that? We want variety. We want to be eating the rainbow, all these fruits and vegetables, not orange juice and potatoes. So we need to work on that. I kind of slowed, showed you this slide last night in different form. We have the leading causes of death in 2014. The blue here is going to be heart disease, right? The number one killer. The purple one is cancer. This is all ages, all causes of death. So we have heart disease, we have cancer, OK? All of these things are a result of inflammation, this chronic low-grade inflammation. You can say what you will. It's plaque buildup, you know, it's autoimmune disease, but it's all a result of this inflammation that's going on, largely because of the poor diets that we eat. So how can we fix this? What can we do to minimize inflammation? Number one thing, eat a whole foods plant-based diet. That's so simple, right? We know that. We're here because we all know that. But it's something to share. On top of that, there's some other extracts we can biohack, we can use to reduce the inflammation in our body even further. OK? These I'm going to go through one by one. We're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about why they reduce inflammation. And a reminder, these are all coming from whole foods. These are not supplements. I'm not asking you to go buy supplements. I'm asking you to actually put them on your food. And they're going to help biohack your inflammation and improve your immune system. So my favorite, we talked about this last night, curcumin. Kind of the same information. I'm just going to reiterate it for you one more time. It's an exceptional antioxidant. It promotes apoptosis, which is that cell death of the mutated cancer cells. It inhibits cancer cell proliferation. And it inhibits inflammation. It's a powerful anti-inflammatory. This slide again, so busy. Why is it up there? It's just to demonstrate there's so many molecular sites of action of curcumin. We know it works in so many different places, so many different ways. That's why that slide's up there. And then here, these are all the established things, once again, that curcumin acts on. So we're looking at all of these, epilepsy, neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease. We can go around that whole circle. And that's a lot of broad diseases that curcumin helps with. Next one, one of my other favorite foods, chili and capsaicin. Anybody know what the spicy part of the chili is? The seeds? Close, but I just learned the other day, it's not even the seeds particularly, it's that channel of that soft red tissue where the seeds sit on. So by default, if you get the seeds in the inner part of your chili, that's the spicy part. That's where the capsaicin is. So capsaicin has been shown to act against obesity and insulin re resistance. It also induces apoptosis, so that programmed cell death. And that VEGF, that factor that we were talking about earlier, the endothelial growth factor, it inhibits that. That's huge. It inhibits blood supply, blood vessels going to these cancer tumors. That's a powerful compound. Ginger's my next favorite. Gingerol is going to be the active compound. It's very good with serum cholesterol, lowering your cholesterol and maintaining good glucose levels. It's very good for people with diabetes and also people that are slightly overweight. It's going to suppress inflammatory action. Next is black pepper. Piperine is the active ingredient in that. And as we quickly mentioned last night, it's something that multiplies your bioavailability of curcumin. So if you're putting turmeric on your food, and you put some black pepper, you grind it over the top, you're going to have 10 times the bioavailability, which is a big biohack. Okay. 
Next is cinnamon. Cinnamon is very good for people with diabetes. Taking cinnamon can lower your hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is that measure of your blood sugar control, how good your diabetes is controlled, okay? Other effects is it's gonna stabilize your glucose levels after you eat. You're not gonna see that spike in blood sugar and the big dip, it's gonna stabilize it. Also helps with gastric emptying. People with diabetes have a problem. They can't empty their stomachs. It doesn't contract as efficiently. It's called gastroparesis. Cinnamon helps with that. It helps the, the stomach empty more efficiently. And then satiety. It helps you with that full feeling so you feel like you've had something substantial to eat. Next one we talked about yesterday as well, the green tea, all right? It's associated with many things, but most notably, a decreased risk of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and then high lipids and cardiovascular disease death. So clinical trials show that there's an improvement in metabolic syndrome and also a decrease in abdominal fat. So green tea, huge one, huge biohack. Keeping on going, I've got a whole bunch of these. Trust me, it was hard to narrow it down. I had to kind of pick the ones that I felt were the most important because there's so many compounds found in natural foods that really help. Berry polyphenols, blueberries and cranberries have the most of them. What they do is these polyphenols, these chemicals actually take up home in the endothelial cells. They live there and they help the endothelial cells. They protect them against oxidative damage, against inflammation, and all these other inflammatory markers that are causing so much damage. Pomegranate, we touched on previously. There's hydrolyzable tannins in there. It's a powerful anti-inflammatory, probably one of the best compounds you could put in your body as well. It's also shown to inhibit angiogenesis, that blood vessel formation in breast cancer and prostate cancer models. Only found in pomegranate. No other compound in the world has this. Grape seed extract, powerful free radical scavenger. It's anti-inflammatory. It's also chemopreventative, been shown to decrease cancer rates. Broccoli sprouts. Some of these we talked about before. The glucosinolates in the broccoli sprouts, that's the chemical you want. That's the thing that's gonna help you. Over 500 studies have been done on broccoli sprouts. We know it inhibits tumor growth. We know it has anti-inflammatory activity. And we know that there's multiple molecular targets that these broccoli sprouts target to make you a healthier person. So these broccoli sprouts, very, very nutritious. Broccoli in itself, in full form, is also very good for you with a lot of cruciferous compounds, but the broccoli sprouts have a much higher concentration. So we also know that broccoli sprouts have a preventative effect on various cancers, cardiovascular disease, upper airway inflammation, and radiation dermatitis. These are all conditions that we know that broccoli sprouts can assist us with. Silibinin, milk thistle, it's a chemopreventative for colon cancer. We talked about that last night. It's been shown to decrease colon cancer formation. It actually targets DNA and the mutation mechanisms, and it decreases inflammation. Milk thistle, again, is one of those things you can dry up, you can make a tea out of, and it is very good as a chemopreventive. I have to touch base on these healthy fats and oils. This is a very controversial area, but it's something we do need to talk about very briefly. So omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, when we ingest them, they're converted to highly unsaturated fatty acids, the HUFAs, we call them. These HUFAs, they accumulate in our tissue membranes and they're converted into potent bioactive mediators. Now this is not just from consuming some oil, we can get these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids from whole foods, from nuts, from avocados, that sort of thing. So it is something we have to be a little bit cognizant about. In medicine, we do trials, and when we do trials, we try to keep them fun, so we make up really strange names for them. This one is Mr. Fit, right? Stands for Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial. What they did, they took people, 12,800 people, and they looked at them for over 10 years. They studied the protective risk factors. They wanted to know what predicts whether a person is gonna develop cardiovascular disease or not. 
They found that people that had an omega-6 ratio of over 50%, meaning that your omega-6, which is your pro-inflammatory fatty acid, if it's over that number, your chances of cardiovascular disease and dying from that are much higher compared to if your ratio is under 50%. So that does become very important. Whether we eat oils or not, whether we are taking in these omega-3s from natural foods or not, these ratios are important. They also found that the percent of omega-6 fatty acids is a valuable biomarker. There's been a lot of controversy lately about cholesterol and what does it mean for us? What does it mean for development of heart disease? And there's a lot of doctors out there that think that cholesterol is not the best predictor, that there are other markers, such as markers of inflammation, your ESR, your CRP, these are sedimentation rates, markers of inflammation. Another one we're finding is our omega-6 ratio. That may be a little bit of a better indicator for onset of cardiovascular disease. Complex picture. What this picture is doing is outlining food and our metabolism and what we do with it, and we get toxicity. So our food, we can get pro-inflammatory mediators that come, and they actually act on vessel walls, they activate platelets, they cause oxidant stress. Over here, they're calling it a postprandial insult, and then you get eventually morbidity and mortality. Health risk assessment, these are a couple websites if you're curious, you can go learn a little more about these fatty acids, how to pick better foods, what have better fatty acid scores, which have higher omega-6 versus omega-3s. One more campaign called Nix the Six and Eat the Three is another good website to go to that will tell you a little more about the ratios and what's best to eat. So, What's the best way to achieve a beneficial omega-6 to omega-3 ratio? Any guess on what I'm gonna say? A whole foods plant-based diet, maybe? It is, that's the best way to do it. You don't wanna be taking supplements, you don't wanna be taking fish oils, you don't wanna be taking anything to try and alter this ratio with the exception of eating a whole foods plant-based diet. If you eat a well-balanced diet, your ratio naturally is gonna be just perfect. So whole foods. One thing I do want to emphasize right now, a lot of us when we turn to our plant-based diet, we use transition foods. So we use these um, imitation meats, the soy meats, that sort of thing. They're actually not so healthy for you. They definitely have their place, don't get me wrong. They help so many people, but they're not that healthy for you. Looking up on those websites that I had shown you, I'm sorry that this text is very small, but what this website does is that they rate each food and they give it a rating. So a negative number is very bad in omega-3, omega-6 balances. They rate it a soy hot dog and you're at a negative 20. That's a pretty bad number. Compare it to a beef hot dog, any guesses? It's pretty bad for you too, right? We've been talking about that. So a beef hot dog is negative two. So it could potentially be that some of these transition foods and these imitation meats are worse for you than just eating whole foods and whole plants. So vegetables, this is a three bean salad. Pinto beans, green beans, kidney beans, you're at a negative one. That's a good number. That's a good ratio. I'm sorry, plus one, thank you. That's a good number. Meatless bacon though is negative 39. Meatless fish sticks also is gonna be negative 25. So just something to keep in mind. And like I said, these foods have their place. They definitely have helped a lot of people. They're tasty, but they're not the best as far as this omega-3, omega-6 ratio is concerned. So moving on, I wanna spend some time talking about this, the microbiome, one of the most fascinating things. Two to six pounds of your body weight is your microbiome. That's bacteria, that's fungi, that's protozoa, even some viruses that just live on our skin. Most of them cause no harm at all. But what they do is they cause a symbiotic relationship. They live with us, we interact, they help us with our immune system. And what we're learning about them is very, very fascinating. Anybody heard of the Human Microbiome Project? It's a project, it was funded by the National Institutes of Health, 
So very well funded. We spent as a country, because our tax dollars did this, we spent $115 million studying the human microbiome. What we did is we took volunteers, they swabbed themselves many places, mouth, rectum, vagina, armpits, sent in their swabs. We grew out bacteria and then we studied them, what kinds they are, what populations they are, and then we compared them to these people's lifestyles. And we're still studying that database today. So we learned that each human being has over 100 trillion microbial cells that live on them. That's a lot. They outnumber human cells 10 to 1. Think about that. More bacteria in our body than human cells. And where do most of them live? They live in the GI tract. <coughs> our stomach has a few. Duodenum, which is the beginning of your small intestine, has a few. Small intestine, you're getting more, but most of them, they live in our colon. Our colon is where we have most of our bacteria. These are the bacteria that are friendly, that usually live, cause no problems. But what happens is we have to have a perfect balance of bacteria. We cannot have an overgrowth of one versus the other. Likewise, we can't have our microbiome wiped out, whether it be from a very toxic bacteria, from an antibiotic, from things like that. We cannot have that balance go into disequilibrium. When we do that, we have inflammation that happens, and our whole microbiome gets out of whack. One thing to know is microbiomes take years to form. This climate, this microbiome that I have, took years. My first three years of age, it was not formed. If I needed antibiotics at that time, that would have been disastrous because it would have wiped out the microbiome that I'm trying to form. Other things that affect our microbiome our genetics, yeah, a little bit, but we can modify that, we're learning. Lifestyle, diet, and stress. We're finding out stress affects our microbiome. Very interesting stuff. The other thing is early colonization. One in three babies in the US is born via C-section today. Giving birth vaginally with this baby going through the birth canal is probably one of the best things that can be done as far as introducing a microbiome to a new life. So skipping that and then having a C-section, the first bacteria that these babies are exposed to are gonna be hospital bacteria, resistant bacteria, bacteria the staph, the strep that don't really do our bodies good. Whereas a vaginal birth, you're getting these commensal bacteria, the ones that do very well. And then on the end, we have medical practices, vaccination use, antibiotics, and hygiene. So again, factors that influence our microbiome. We know diet plays a huge role. Some bacteria love to live on sugar. Those aren't the bacteria we want. A lot of yeast love to live on sugar. So artificial sweeteners, things that have too much sugar in them, not enough fiber, alcohol, farmed livestock, these all are gonna cause different bacteria to live in our microbiome. Medications. So all these medications, antibiotics, I'm gonna to touch on a little more in a second, steroids, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, so ibuprofen affects our microbiome. Oral contraceptive pills, so external estrogen that we take is gonna affect our microbiome. Proton pump inhibitors, one of the most common medications Americans take for heartburn, very much affects our microbiome. You're basically wiping out all the acid in your stomach that's gonna change the bacteria that can get through your GI tract and chemotherapy, of course. Stress is another one. Soaps. Our rage and our fascination with antibacterial soaps is probably one of the worst things we could have done as a country. Washing with these hand sanitizers all the time, not only are we killing the bad bacteria, but we're killing the good bacteria. We're wiping off every living thing on our microbiome. And when there's nothing there, there's dangerous bacteria that take up house. Infections, 
Many people that have an altered microbiome that can trigger chronic diseases, it's usually one inciting event. A lot of them say, well, I traveled to Mexico and I had Montezuma's revenge or really bad diarrhea, and that wiped out their microbiome. And then what came in after that? It's never the same. You're never going to have the microbiome that you had before. And chlorinated water. So almost all of our tap water is chlorinated. A lot of our bacteria just doesn't do well, even with low levels of chlorine. It's toxic. So that's going to be altering our microbiome as well. Over 60% of antibiotics that we as doctors prescribe these days are inappropriate. They don't meet guidelines. We have patients that come to our office, and a lot of times they expect an antibiotic, so we prescribe it. Or we think, oh, I'll give you an antibiotic just in case. It just might help. We want to prevent an illness or treat an illness. Antibiotics have their place. There's no doubt about it. But they're overprescribed, and they're causing many problems. They're causing drug-resistant bacteria that kill very many people. And not only that, but they wipe out microbiomes. Hard to treat infections acquired in the hospital. So a hospital is a training ground for resistant superbugs. These hard to treat infections kill more Americans every year than murder and car accidents combined. These superbugs that we worry about, they kill so many people and largely it's our faults because we've been prescribing antibiotics and taking antibiotics when they're not needed. So in that scenario, an ounce of prevention is not worth a pound of cure saying, I'm going to give you antibiotics just in case, prophylactically, it's not worth it. This is a paper that looked at gut microbia and metabolic syndrome. When you look at the microbiome of people that are obese versus skinny, it's different. It could be different for a number of reasons. It could be because of how we eat, etc. But there was a study done in rats, and I know it was in rats, not people, but they took obese rat stool transplanted into the mice that were skinny, and the mice got fat. They didn't change anything else. There's some connection between our microbiome, what bacteria are in our gut and metabolize, and obesity. This paper had this schematic in it. So when we eat a Western diet, our burgers, we get a big change in our intestinal microbiota. And what that does, it causes inflammatory proteins to go up, you get increased insulin resistance, more hormones, and you get basically this low-grade chronic inflammatory state. This is a supermarket in the Western world. I don't see much for fresh fruits and vegetables there. A lot of processed foods. Compare that to a market in a country called Burkina Faso. Anybody know where that is? It's in Africa. Yeah. They got a lot of fresh fruits, vegetables. I don't see anything processed or packaged there. They did a study, some scientists, where they looked at the microbiomes of people from Italy, so in a Western world with packaged food, and Burkina Faso. The brand new newborn babies had almost the exact same microbiome which is very interesting. As they grew up through life, the ones in Burkina Faso had a much healthier, much more diverse microbiome, largely because of where they were. And yeah, maybe they weren't exposed to antibiotics or chemicals and all this other stuff, but they had a much healthier microbiome. Another study looked at the microbiome of Amazon tribesmen versus Americans. Americans only have two-thirds as many bacterial species as native tribesmen in the Amazon. So you might want to know, you know, what do we do with this information? How do I know how healthy my microbiome is? Well, the good news is you can find out if you want. I have no financial relationship with this company. I'm just putting it up there because I find it so interesting. You can go, get a kit, swab yourself, send it in, and they'll come and tell you your microbiome. They'll tell you how diverse it is. They'll tell you how you compare to other people, including other vegetarians, meat eaters, etc. cetera. Costs about $100. Get your results back in a few weeks. 
And then the cool thing is, is you can change something. You can say, well, I want to exercise more. So you exercise more, maybe change your diet. In a month, do it again, and they'll compare. You can see the changes, which is kind of neat as well. So this is brand new science. This technology is based on the technology used for the Human Microbiome Project. So it's new stuff, very, very cool. Anybody heard of this lady or read this book? This is Robin Chutkin. She was on Obama's list, short list for Surgeon General a few years ago. She's a gastroenterologist, an integrative gastroenterologist. Very interesting lady. But she wrote this book, The Microbiome Solution. And one of her most favorite quotes or her premise is you want to live dirty and eat clean. And those are some good rules to live by. The hygiene hypothesis is a hypothesis that's been out there for a while. We're talking about our clean America, our antibacterial soaps, our very clean houses, and how they actually damage our microbiomes and make us more susceptible to things like asthma, autism, this whole epidemic of new diseases that's becoming so common. If we can maintain and grow a healthy microbiome, a lot of this can be prevented. Our immune system will be very, very strong. So why do we care? What do our gut bacteria do? A whole bunch of things. So they convert sugars into short-chain fatty acids for energy. You're going to be crowding out bacteria or pathogens, which is bad bacteria. Digest food, of course. They help our body absorb nutrients, keep our pH balanced. They maintain the integrity of our gut lining, metabolize drugs, modulate germs, neutralize cancer-causing compounds, produce digestive enzymes, synthesize B-complex vitamins and fat-soluble vitamins, and synthesize hormones. This is important. Our gut bacteria are so vitally important, and the change in our bacteria is going to dictate our immune system and our inflammation. So all in all, you're only as healthy as your gut bacteria. And we talked about this, the infection. The, a lot of people, especially with inflammatory bowel disease, so that's Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, they can trace it back to an inciting event. And it usually is something like a chronic or an acute illness, like a diarrhea from traveling or from some food that they ate. They got very sick, cleaned out their microbiome, and whatever took out house or took up house is causing the inflammatory disease. Crohn's disease is named after a guy, Dr. Crohn. And he's a guy who apparently discovered it. But he had a theory, and bad, this was over 150 years ago. He said, I think Crohn's disease is related to a bacteria. He was essentially laughed off the stage. People said, no way. This is an autoimmune disease. The bacterial theory was debunked until recently. We're starting to find out he might have been right. Crohn's disease can be due to an overgrowth of the wrong bacteria causing the inflammation. This was published in the New York Times just last week. It's a very curious question. Should we bank our own stool? And this article goes on to talk about, well, if we have a healthy microbiome now, why don't we bank our stool such that if we were to get sick, or we knew if we were going to need antibiotics, we could just give ourselves a stool transplant, we'd have our microbiome back. It's an interesting question and very plausible. A fecal microbiota transplant, FMT. Anybody heard of these? Yeah. So there's a bacteria that we have in our hospital. It's called C. diff, or Clostridium difficile. Very, very bad bacteria. This is a bacteria that takes up house when our microbiome is off balance or depleted. The C. diff comes, and what do you think we treat it with as doctors? More antibiotics, of course. We're going to treat it with something we think is going to work. Yeah, it works sometimes. New research is showing a stool transplant treats C. diff over 90% of the time. That is better results than antibiotics, better results than surgery. Sometimes we have to do emergency surgery on C. diff. Better than all of that. That's fantastic. And actually, a lot of the new modern GI doctors are pioneering this. 
So then we naturally have to question, are there other reasons for doing a transplant? Any diarrhea associated with antibiotics, that's a valid reason. And intestinal dysbiosis, when we have our, our microbiome off balance, that could be a good reason. This paper was recently published, 2015, talking about other implications. So not only the three that I just mentioned, but are there other reasons that maybe we should be talking about transplanting microbiomes? And yes, there's a whole bunch. Small text, but these are non-GI things. You're looking at metabolic diseases, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is what I talked about last night, neuropsych disorders. There's a connection between the gut and the brain, a microbial axis. We're finding that a lot of people that have had antibiotics at a young age or have their microbiomes depleted have a higher risk of autism, Alzheimer's, dementia. It's very interesting stuff. None of these, of course, are FDA approved. These are all proposed reasons and they're actively undergoing study. But I have a feeling a lot of this will pan out to be beneficial. Now, I don't want you leaving here today thinking that we all need stool transplants, because we don't. These are very hazardous as well. There's a lot of diseases that come across as well. You have AIDS, hepatitis, you have all these CMV, these very communicable diseases. You get bad bacteria with good bacteria. So that's something that is a known risk of this. When we do this in the hospital, we definitely screen our patients. The sample usually comes from a loved one, usually a spouse, and it's very, very well screened. So the chances of that are pretty low. That book, The Microbiome Solution, and I'm not advocating this in any way, but she has a whole chapter on DIY, do-it-yourself, stool transplant at home, if you're interested. But very interesting stuff. So some hacks. How can we keep our microbiome healthy? What can we do to get the healthiest microbiome and prevent disease? Number one, of course it has to do with diet, right? Eat a lot of high fiber plant matter in the form of vegetables and fruits. Our bacteria, the healthy bacteria in our gut, love insoluble fiber. They love it. So if you can eat more of those, you're much better off. Choose your carbohydrates carefully. Avoid your white sugars. Avoid fructose corn syrup. Avoid refined carbohydrates. You want to always choose the whole grain option. Whole grain, brown rice, not the white stuff. Ferment your food. Fermented food is so full of bacteria and probiotics. Kimchi, sauerkraut. Who here's heard of Rejuvalac? Yeah, very cool stuff. You can make it at home, soaking any sort of grain. You get very good bacteria from that. And miso is another one. Fermented food is one of the best things you can do to help repopulate your microbiome. Shower less. As Americans, I think we're a little too clean. We shower a little too much. We scrub soap all over everywhere. We get rid of all of our microbiome, all these really nice bacteria that are living on our skin. We wash away quite frequently. So we want to avoid antibacterial soap. AOB, ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Body odor, when we sweat and we start to smell, the key ingredient in that is ammonia. So if we can get rid of this ammonia, we can actually decrease our body odor. So let's say we're not showering. If we have a good population of these AOB bacteria that oxidize ammonia, we shower less and we smell less, which is actually a pretty good thing. Sodium lauryl sulfate is an ingredient in a lot of our soap, shampoos. It also, it helps you get a good lather on your skin, but it doesn't do much good for your microbiome. Recommendation is bathe no more than every other day, if you can help it. I know as Americans we try to be very clean, but sometimes skipping a shower or two can be better for your germs on your body, the good germs. And then they say for your hair, you don't want to shampoo more than once a week. So you can wet it, rinse it out, but if you can help it, try not to shampoo, because that gets rid of your natural oils. 
We already beat this one to death. Avoid antibiotics. But I want you, all of you, every single one of you as patients, to be very active, to be advocates for yourself. If you go into a doctor and you are prescribed, it doesn't have to be an antibiotic, a medication for any reason, I want you to be asking why. I want you to be asking what the side effects are. And what happens if I don't take this medication? You need to know that. It's very important. And nobody cares more about yourself than yourself. So make sure you are an advocate for that. Get a pet. Pets carry the best germs in and out of your house. They expose you to it. Children that grow up in a household with pets have lower incidence of autoimmune diseases and asthma. It's good to have a pet. This is my dog, by the way. That's Chaucer. <laughs> He's a sweetie. And then open up your home. If you can, open your windows, open your door, let the wind blow in. You'll get a lot of bacteria that way that are good. Michael Pollan wrote a book a few years ago called The Omnivore's Dilemma. I don't know if anybody has read that. But it's a book where he was trying to really create a meal out of things that were very natural. And he tried to bake bread. So instead of using yeast, he had his concoction of dough, and he had a little bowl that he just set out with his windows open, let the wind blow in, and he got natural yeast, natural bacteria, and he actually baked bread that way. Something you can do. I mean, our air is not sterile, but the more that we can open our house up and just wash out all the carpet chemicals and paint that's in there and get more natural stuff in there, the better for us and our health. Probiotics. I don't generally recommend taking a probiotic supplement. There are a few situations where you have patients that have this irritable bowel disease that's not curable with this whole foods diet or they need a jump start to replenishing their microbiome, then probiotics are good. So definition of probiotics, the microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit to the host. So they give us a health benefit. Dietary sources are best, of course. If you need a prescription strength, this is probably the best studied probiotic. It's called VSL number three. If you're buying a probiotic over the counter, you wanna make sure there's at least seven different strains and there's at least 50 billion colon forming units of the two most important types, which are lactobacillus and bifidobacillus bacteria. And then you want to make sure that it's enteric coated. Our acid in our stomach can actually damage some of these probiotics. So if you are going to take a supplement, I'd recommend following those guidelines. And then you want to give it time. 30 days minimum. It may take several months before you see improvement if you have a severe case of GI upset and a not well populated microbiome. So stick with it. Anyone heard of prebiotics? We all know about probiotics. Prebiotics are kind of a new thing. They're fascinating as well. Basically what it is is a certain type of dietary fiber, the non-digestible fiber as I talked about, so non-soluble fibers. This is the stuff that feeds our bacteria. It's a prebiotic. It's crucial in maintaining a healthy microbiome. Examples of prebiotics are whole foods. Lentils, beans, oats, nuts, apples, flax, chia, green bananas. Green bananas because they're not digested so they get pretty far down in your digestive tract, like your colon, where they're important for the microbes that need them. And quickly back to probiotics. A lot of new research on this as well. The use of probiotics to reset your gut microbiome has been shown to improve outcomes in those diseases, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and heart failure. And then you have to do a double take. What, did she just say probiotics can help cure cardiovascular disease? How can that be? It absolutely can. Just ask Canada. They, our Canadian friends, have approved one specific probiotic, but a probiotic to be prescribed to prevent cardiovascular disease. This is in lieu of statins. And they've shown that this probiotic is gonna lower your LDL cholesterol by 11.6%. So not huge, 
Not a huge amount like a whole foods plant-based diet will, but it's a start. Probiotics, there's a lot we don't know about them. New data, and we're gonna learn more and more every day. Lastly, I just wanna to touch on telomeres. Have we all heard about telomeres? Okay, all right. So telomeres, our cells, when they divide throughout our lifetime, we can't just divide an infinite number of times. Every time we divide, our cells lose a little bit of this cap on the end of our chromosome. That's the telomere. This is age 25, and as we go to age 45 or shorter, telomere is already. As we age all the way to age 75, our telomeres in an average person are almost depleted. When the telomeres are depleted, that's going to mean cell death. So telomeres are implicated in many things, but we care about telomeres because we care about telomere length. So Elizabeth Blackburn is the one who discovered telomeres, 1984. She won a Nobel Prize for it in 2009. She suggested that telomere shortening was linked with many things, but most of all, aging at the cellular level and lifespan. Telomeres were also implicated in development of certain cancers, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and the rate of telomere shortening was linked with inflammation and aging. I kind of feel like I'm repeating myself. I keep saying cardiovascular disease, diabetes, inflammation, aging, all of these things are so interrelated. And the telomeres are another way to measure all of this stuff. So telomere shortening is what we do not want. Things that speed up telomere shortening, we need to avoid. Smoking is number one. We know that smoking is gonna speed up the shortening of your telomeres. Two is obesity. Obese people have a quicker telomere shortening rate. Three is exposure to environmental toxins. They did a study, they looked at the telomeres of traffic police. So people that stand on the corner all day ingesting pollution from cars, their telomeres were way shorter when compared to policemen that were not on the corner directing traffic. Stress. Stress speeds up your telomere shortening. There was a study done on stress, particularly in women. And when you have severe stress as a woman, your telomeres shorten at a rate so much that it can shorten your life by 10 years. So stress is a big implicator. If we can do things such as meditation, mindfulness, yoga, to try to decrease our stress, that's gonna help slow down our rate of telomere shortening. And then a fatty diet. When I had touched on that omega-6, omega-3 ratio, if you have a high omega-6 ratio, you're gonna have a quicker telomere shortening rate. So what can we do? What are some biohacks where we can try to slow down the rate of our telomere shortening? Hmm. Talked about that a lot. High fiber diet. That's gonna slow down our rate of telomere shortening. Decreased waist circumference, which is a lot like obesity. So we've shown that the people that have a decreased waist circumference have a slower rate of telomere shortening. If you decrease your protein intake and you change your protein type. So if you decrease it and you change to a plant-based protein, you're gonna have a slower rate of telomere shortening. More omega-3 fatty acids, less omega-6 is gonna shorten your, or slow down your rate. As many antioxidants as you can cram into your diet is gonna help. Dietary restriction, that's an interesting one. They've done some studies that show that people who fast have a lower rate, slower rate of telomere shortening. A lot more research to be done on that yet. And then exercise. They've actually studied exercise. If you do your recommended amount of exercise every day, your telomeres are gonna stay longer. So telomere maintenance. Again, I have no commercial stock in this, but I'm telling you this more out of interest. There's commercial ventures forming. These are brand new. We're still learning the implications of what it means for us and what the health impacts are. But you can go online. You can send in a sample, send in a swab. 
$150, you'll get your telomere length. What does that mean to us? Well, they've statistically made some sort of formula. They can tell you your chances of living to 100, looking at your telomere length. How accurate is that? I'm not sure. But what's more accurate is this length compared to other people in your age group and diet um, classifications. And then you can do the same thing here. You can buy a package where you can send in your telomere swab again in three or four months and see if you've actually changed that because you can. That's the beauty of all this. It's so empowering. We can change this. We can change the rate that our telomeres shorten. We can change the rate at which we age. We can change our inflammation levels in our body. We can improve our immune system. All of these things are so easily done. Whether you want to call them biohacks or eating healthy, these are all things that can be very easily done. And it's exciting. It's empowering. We should all feel very, very strong in the fact that we can manipulate this. So in closing, this chronic low-grade inflammation is something that we deal with every day. If we can eat foods to lower that chronic inflammation, we're going to lower our risk of diseases and ultimately death. I honestly believe inflammation is where it's at. If we can follow a diet where our inflammation levels are down, we're going to be golden. So I hope you can take that home with you today, and I'll welcome any questions. How can you have your inflammation level tested? I'm sorry? H how can you have your inflammation level tested? Is that on a blood test? So or? your inflammation level, we have some crude tests for that these days. We have an ESR and a CRP are two blood tests you can get to level and track your inflammation. The ESR, actually both of those levels are a good marker of chronic low-grade inflammation. That being said, if you have an acute inflammatory event, something like an illness, um, your, those levels are going to spike, and that's normal. But besides that, you should be able to track that. The other thing is just a general overall well-being of your health is going to tell you how your inflammation is doing, how you're feeling. Um, with probiotic use, when would you suggest using them? I've heard that if you've been sick, that maybe um, repopulating your gut bacteria with a probiotic is, is a good idea, but how long do you take the probiotic? So a lot of it is going to depend on your symptoms. If you take a probiotic till you feel better, that's a great thing. And the same would go for needing a probiotic. Oftentimes, if we're ill, we can rebound on our own with no problem. But if we're feeling that we're not quite right, that we're having you know, symptoms of what we call dysbiosis, which is going to be that chronic fatigue, um, bowel irregularities, that sort of thing, then yes, it's very reasonable. But I would also recommend still trying to do the prebiotics just from a whole foods diet, from the fermented foods, before trying to take the supplements. The antibiotics that are used in food, <clears throat> uh, I mean, in the animals, for instance, so when people eat a lot of animal products, are they getting a lot of antibiotics? You absolutely have to think that they do. Um, you cannot go through this whole discussion about antibiotics without talking about these animals that have gotten the antibiotics, which subsequently get passed on to you with the bacteria. The other important thing, not animal specific, but is the corn, that BT toxin that we talked about. That's something that is also a GMO type thing that we cannot get rid of that is going into our bodies when we eat that corn. Um, a question about yogurt, and I know the importance of being careful with dairy intake and such, but just doing a plain yogurt, and the only thing maybe you would add would be blueberries or something like that. Is yogurt valuable, do you think? I don't think yogurt is valuable. It contains casein, which is a direct carcinogen. I would try to stay away from any of those dairies. You can get uh, almond yogurts, that type of thing, that have probiotics in them as well. Um, you can make your own cheeses, if you like, and inoculate them with probiotics. Uh, the Rejuvalac is a very good way, much better way. I have uh, two daughter-in-laws that are nurses, and in order for them to practice nursing, they have to have the flu shot. What is your take on that? <laughs> That's a can of worms. I'll tell you that one of my very good colleagues uh, ended up retiring over the flu shot because he refused to get it in the hospital. Um, required him to get it. 
As for me, I personally do take the flu shot, and that's a, a personal decision that I've made, primarily because I know I have a lot of immunocompromised patients that I can place them at risk for. Even though I have a healthy immune system and I know that I'm gonna be healthy, I worry about them. So that's a decision I've made. As for the average person, if you have a healthy microbiome, you should be able to fight off the flu without needing the vaccine. I hope that answers your question. Um, I had a joint replacement surgery several years ago, and every time I visit the dentist now, they insist that I take a large dose of antibiotics prior to the appointment. Do you think that's necessary? Because I don't feel like I'm a high risk for a problem. That's one of those examples of prophylactics, so trying to prevent something. Now, you always have to weigh the risks versus the benefits. Having an infection in your prosthetic joint is a big deal, so you're always trying to weigh that. I think it's gonna depend on the amount of work that you are having done, um, and also it might be worthwhile to seek out an integrative dentist that you can talk to about it and maybe explore some other options. But that is a very perfect example of giving antibiotics out of fear, right? Thank you so much. We're talking a lot about inflammation, and I was wondering if the conversation about inflammation and acidity are the same, like when we're talking about acidity and alkalinity, and then we're talking about inflammation, is, is that kind of the same conversation or are they two different? They're no doubt interrelated. When we talk about inflammation and prime um, habitats for bacteria that are harmful, of course they like an acidic environment. So acidity is gonna be a promoter of that. But as far as them being intertwined, uh, there's not that much established in the literature with that, but common sense would lead me to say that yes, they're very closely intertwined. I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but I've seen a lot of controversy about the government forcing food producers to label GMO products as GMO, and there's been a lot of fight against that. But it seems like if we went from the other end where food producers who don't use GMO can label their products as non-GMO, then that would be solving the same problem. And I, I drink this um, almond milk, and it doesn't say non-GMO on it, but if you go on their website, it says, yeah, absolutely, we use non-GMO almonds. But it's confusing to me why they don't emblazon that on their label. So as us going forward, it, it seems like more food producers should label their products as non-GMO, I would buy them. I absolutely agree. And I think there is a big movement with a lot of manufacturers putting that label on their non-GMO, and I think it's gonna grow. It's another good example of, like I had talked about last night, where we, we need to vote with our dollars. If we see something in the store that has the anti-GMO label or the non-GMO, maybe we should be buying that one if we can, just to support that, and just by default, it will blossom. Pomegranates. Yes. I love them. Um, kind of a pain to eat. <laughs> yes, and they are. I'm wondering if drinking organic cold pressed pomegranate juice is as effective as eating whole pomegranates. It's going to be as effective. The thing you want to be careful with juice is that it's concentrated, right? So you're going to have a higher level of those natural sugars. So you might want to be taking that in moderation, um, even just a little bit, a lot less than if you were to eat a whole pomegranate. Because you think about how much juice do you get if you juice an entire pomegranate, maybe like that much. So you might want to take that into account. As with any fruit juice, you want to be very, very careful with that. This is somewhat a comment. I had the good fortune of seeing Cowspiracy, and I would give it a tremendous plug. It's an incredible documentary. On the subject of GMOs, the uh, House passed, uh, it's called H.R. 1599, by uh, 230 Republicans and 45 Democrats voted for it. And it, at a federal level, would deny us the right to know if the product is genetically modified and would invalidate those state laws that have already passed. It's in the Senate now, but uh, there, I think that we could be more politically aware, and that's important as well. But Cowspiracy is really kind of on this theme, and definitely we're seeing. That's a great comment. Thank you. It's something that I do feel, it, you know, if you feel strongly about that, we do need to become more active, and the only way we can do that is by speaking up. You mentioned drinking green tea, and I was wondering if it matters if it's caffeinated or if it's decaf or if one is better than the other. 
So caffeine levels are something that can be very harmful. They can also be very beneficial. Depending on your preference, I prefer having caffeine, but I would not say that that is the more beneficial choice. You can get non-caffeinated green tea and you're still gonna get the same exact benefits. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Dyken.